Welcome to Eagle Live. What a break from Manoa. Interviewing your favorite USA Eagles around the globe. Tony Lambeau into the 22. Now, here's your host, Bill Baker. Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Eagle Eyed Rugby Podcast. Today I have retired USA International James Hildebrand. We recorded this last week after the Manly Marlins kicked off their 2021 Shoot Shield season by getting drubbed 78-10, but have since uh, bounced back with a 24-22 win this past weekend. Now, we talk about that big opening weekend loss and how does a team react to such a loss. Also, Cecil talks about uh, what has drawn him to the Manly Marlins all these years from academy to senior level. Now, the last time we saw Cecil playing in a USA uniform was after or during the 2019 World Cup, and then right after he retired from international play. Uh, We talk about that because we haven't had a chance to talk since the World Cup. There's been no rugby for a while also. But we talk about what went into his decision to retire. Uh, Enjoy the interview. Uh, Here I am with Cecil. Yeah, Mr. Hiltebrand, how are you? I'm all right. And you, Bill, you well? I'm doing well, thank you. That's good. Where are you, bro? I'm up in Boston. Oh, God. What's the weather like up there? Actually, today, uh, not too bad. You know, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, sunny, so I'll take that. Yeah, right. It should be uh, starting to get warmer for us, but uh, getting colder for you, right? A little bit, yeah. A little bit, but I don't think it's ever going to get as cold as what you guys are used to, unfortunately, for you. Uh Nice climate you have there. <laughs> very much so, very much so. So are you a Free Jack supporter? Yeah, I am. Um, I've been out to their one first game, their one home game so far, and uh, cheer them on as much as I can. Yeah, you following the MLR much? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, like, obviously just been a U.S. rugby player, but then also um, the brand I work for, Paladin, we actually supply the whole of oh, yeah. MLR. So from Is two- that some, that's some of your product in the back wall? Yeah, hats. I'll do the hats for Paladin. Oh, nice. So, nice. Yeah, by the way, first of all, what do you like to be called? I've seen so many ways. Yeah. Cecil, James, Jim. <laughs> yeah, and no, I've got a few colorful nicknames. Slunyip, Swampy, Cecil. Uh, some that probably shouldn't be mentioned on, on camera. But uh, yeah, Cecil will do, man. That's, uh, that's, I, don't, I don't get called James much anymore. No, not anymore. Uh, all right, Cecil. So uh, what are you up to these days besides rugby? As obviously, you have the company you work from there, but uh, what are you up to right now? Yeah, um, mate, my missus has moved in and she's got a sausage dog, so I'm a part owner ah. of a sausage dog. Um, <laughs> obviously, playing rugby for the Marlins, working at Paladin, um, mate, reading a few books, trying to keep off the streets. I've matured a bit, so I'm probably not out terrorizing the clubs and pubs <laughs> like I used to. Uh, yeah. That used to be passed on, but I'm like, yeah, I'm a bit more mature now. So what's your role with the company? Uh, business development um, and sales. So I look after headwear. Um, I help clubs um, get their stuff. Um, I work with Matt Walsh, who runs Paladin America, um, mm-hmm. to product develop uh, certain features and 1% uh, parts of you know the items, like the jerseys, silicon, this, three-dimensional logos. Um, some pretty cool stuff. Um, which is a bit of fun. keeps me keeps me very uh, very interested and very challenged. And hopefully busy enough where you're not around the sausage dog all day long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 my sausage dog duties are fairly limited, um, which is good. <laughs> so talking about Manly, um, you just kicked off the 2021 season. Obviously, not the first weekend you were hoping for. Um, you know how how does your team bounce back from a defeat like that? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, You'd like to think it can't get any worse, um, but the reality is, is it, it probably can. Um, you repeat the, you repeat that same performance, and that's definitely getting worse because you're, you're obviously not improving. Um, I think it's pretty interesting because you get to a point, you know, Sunday, Monday, when we do our reviews, where you got so many balls up in the air of you know what we could have done better, because realistically we were very bad at a lot of different things, but you can't fix everything. So you sort of got to plug the leaks that you can. So you know, if you're in a sinking boat and you got a hundred holes, you can't fix, you can't plug them all at one go. So we're plugging the biggest holes we can, um, which has been connection and defence. Um, guys are making breaks, obviously, through the middle of the line rather than you know out wide and on the edge. So we've got to shore up our connection with our middle defenders to make sure they can't break through there. Um, 
And then just some basic skill execution, which doesn't need any real special fancy drill to fix. I think it's more mental application than anything. So those are the two things that we're focusing on this week. So we had our video review, or we had a, a get together Sunday, video review Monday, um, then a light gym session, field session Tuesday. Um, and then we've got our final field session tonight. And I know we've all been through a match like that where we've either lost by a lot or won by a lot. I hope, I hope, heels, I hope you haven't. It's a horrible I thing. have, uh, at both sides of them over the years. So uh, obviously a match like that is tough on the psyche of the players, you know, recovering from it. But what is what does even a coach say to a team like that? Does a coach just say, forget it, let's start over on Monday? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think naturally, pretty much immediately after the game, there's a bit of emotion involved. So it's probably not quite as, um, as simple and as um, PC as forget about it. Um, in yeah. the sheds, there's probably a few... Yeah, uh, some emotionally charged conversations, which is fine because that means you care. Um, so we got that out of our system Saturday night. Um, I think um, it was a bit like a funeral Saturday night because everyone sort of was a bit, you know, sort of lost for words, really. Um, but uh, I, I know quite a few guys went and had a few beers together, which I think helps the sort of the healing process get over that initial reaction of, geez, we suck. Um, Sunday, we actually had a, a spit at my house. So I did uh, 12 kilos of chicken thigh on the spit, and we all, again, so just use that time to um, basically, you know, get it out in the open. Like we sucked, but unfortunately, the more we think about it, uh, the less it's going to help, uh, or the more it's going to impact us the next week, and we're going to play potentially as bad. So, I think by Monday, um, we pretty much got all the shit out of our system where we could actually look at the detail of what went wrong. Um, and like I said, probably the two simple things was connection in the middle in defence, and then just basic skill execution. Um, and by that time, Monday night, it was fairly detailed chat about what we can do better. Um, it didn't have the emotion in it, which is obviously what we needed to, to get better. You've been uh, with Manly on and off really since you you know came up, up the ranks. You, you climbed the ranks with the Marlins. Mm. You left to go overseas, there and that. What is it about this club that attracts you to keep coming back and um, probably finishing off your career? Yeah, um, good question. So I, I left Adelaide in 2008 to come play for Manly. Um, I saw I played under 20s there. And then, like you said, I was um, at the Tars briefly and then went over to Perth, from Perth, Edinburgh, South Africa. And then obviously that's when my sort of, my US career started. Um, and then the whole time, the, the, the community feel around the club is as unique as it gets. Um, when I was at the uh, Tars for a brief little training gig, I didn't even play. Um, in 2011, there was this feel around the Waratahs that it was it was a club, um, and people happened to get paid for it. It was a really really unique atmosphere, and I compare um, the Marlins to that. Um, there's a lot of guys. There's a majority of guys at the club would be there if they weren't getting paid, or if they were getting paid, you you, you wouldn't know the difference. Um, and it's because we've got this insular community where there's pretty much one road in and one road out that everyone hates. It's called the Spit Road, <laughs> that um, separates sort of us from everywhere else. Um, and it means that we all stick stick together essentially and, and that's players but that's also the, the supporters that's the kids that want to play for the Marlins the young fellas um, and obviously the parents that come to the, bring the kids to the game um, so there's there's just a feel there's a connection within the club and the community that you feel like you're a part of something more um, and I think that's uh, I think we're very very lucky to be a part of that um, because with that becomes a sense of investment you, you know you become invested and in, in emotionally connected to something which is where growth happens um, when you're a part of something like that, when you're doing something for more than just yourself. You know, I noticed, uh, so you play at the Oval, yeah. which seems like a really interesting place and fun place to play. It seems like the crowd is really into your matches. Uh, I mean, what is it like to play in a place like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's, there's many different parts to it, funnily enough. There's the, the, UFO, the UFO Flying Saucer, which is sort of where the, yeah. the, fan, the fans <laughs> sit. There's, there's actually a lady there, Judy, who's been to every single Manly Marlins game. So I was talking about community. She's, Judy's been to every single Manly Marlins game, I think, for 17 years or something stupid like this. It might even be longer, to be honest with you. Um, and that's the kind of crowd and supporters we have. So th th there's sort of her section under the UFO, the Flying Saucer. Um, there's the, the tennis court side, which is some of the away team, but then typically the um, sort of like the ex-Marlins players. Um, they're over there, and they're always just smashing tins with their kids, sort of running around doing whatever. They pretend like they're supervising them, but they're not. Um, and then there's the hill, which is all the current players, um, which... You know, after six or seven tins, they they tend to lob some abuse at the opposition team, which is pretty helpful for us. <laughs> so there's sort of different. There's a lot of different paths to the oval where you get the supporters go to different spots, um, and it's just uh, it's known for its cricket pitch, which is unfortunately like a bit of a cheese grater during the season. 
So um, you do your best to keep your feet on the cricket pitch so you don't lose a bit of skin. Um, but mate, it's just been around for a very, very long time, and there's so many old. Fo- We've got a lot of photos in our gym um, of some, you know, games and players at the Oval that you look at, and, you, and they're still in black and white. So there's just a lot of history involved there because the club hasn't changed fields. Um, there's different parts of the place where people watch in different areas, and um, yeah, mate, it's just a very, very cool place. It is a cricket oval, so the turf outside the cricket pitch is very nice, but unfortunately, yeah, the, the cricket pitch itself is um, known as a cheese grater. How are your cricket skills? Mine? No, I'm good yeah. at sledging. I'm good. I can't bat, I can't bowl, but I can get in the batsman's heads. I reckon I'd be good at that. Before you get a bat to your head at some point. but Yeah, I'll be, yeah potentially. I'll wear a helmet. So speaking of skills, I've, I've seen some videos of you. You're dancing and, and singing and leading the uh, the home crowd post-match. Oh, the boom boom. Yeah. Is that so what, what is that? Yeah, so that's our club song. So whenever we win a game, um, we sing that song. And I think the one you're referring to, we beat the Rats in which is our biggest rival. It's equivalent yeah. to America versus Canada. Um, it's a big, big, big uh-huh. rivalry. Um, we beat them in first grade. And so the hill, which is obviously where all the you know, like the third, fourth grade players are after they've played their game, um, we wandered over there and we did the song in front of them. So I don't know if you what I don't know if you can call what I did during the song dancing. It was probably more <laughs> yeah. More like Interpretive just, dance. You were yeah, uh... yeah. <laughs> Really, since the last time we saw USA on um, playing rugby was when you were uh, the last World Cup. Yeah. <clears throat> right before you, you retired. But since then, we haven't heard anything. Obviously, we haven't had a chance to talk to you, you know, mm. nobody. So but let's talk about that retirement decision real quick. Uh, you know, what went into that decision? You know, what was the difficulties of that? And why was that the right time for you to retire? Um. I guess for me, um, so my first tour was just after the uh, World Cup prior. Um, so it was in February when John Mitchell just came on board. So I had, um, you know, you'd say four and a bit years um, of tours and playing with the US team. Um, and it was incredible. Um, like my, my father's obviously f- fully American. I've got obviously an American passport. Uh, very proud of my American heritage. Um, obviously, as my father is, it meant, meant and means a lot to him and means a lot to me. Um, I'm 31 now, turning 32 in May. Um, I'm very lucky to have had and continue having the career I've had, but I think at some point in time, you, you've sort of got to reflect. You've got to take a minute, step back and reflect on things. And I look at what I've been a part of in the US team and with my rugby career since 2015, and I've done some really, really cool things. And I'm so happy with it, so proud proud of it. Um, and I don't want to be in a position where I, I, I wanted to retire on my own terms. Um, and also having learned from other people where they not hung around, that they sort of felt compelled to stay in rugby longer than they needed to because that was all they knew. Um, for me... I've had a, a bit of a rocky career with a, a contract taken away from me at Edinburgh, a contract um, being, um, I don't even know what you want to call it, but the Eastern Province Kings who I was with in South Africa went bankrupt. So I've had little patches of my career where I've essentially been unemployed. So I, I know what life is like outside of rugby. So I don't have the same um, connection. I don't have the same um, to need to play rugby as maybe some other people have because I've seen what life's like on the other side of the fence. Um, so I was looking at my career coming into the World Cup thinking what well, I look at guys like KP who's with Saris who's an unreal hooker coming through he's, he's quite young um, Dylan Fawcett at Rooney um, unreal hooker then there's obviously Joey um, he add myself into the mix with other guys coming through in MLR and it becomes a really really competitive position um, which is unreal and it's great um, but I think me holding on to my position when I, I probably it might be better off to a, a younger kid coming through MLR. I think it's probably stifling that sort of, it's blocking the pipe a little bit for the hookers. Um, mm-hmm. Me wanting to finish on at the right time, wanting to finish before I sort of pass my use by date and then also give, you know, the next crop um, their opportunity. Uh, it, it, it's, it's quite a full stop, I think, the World Cup. Um, a lot went into it. Um, we were training for, a, we were on the road for a good three months um, to get there. So for me, it was sort of like the last hurrah. Um, and it was, like I said, it's, it's, it's something, it's a, a sort of a chapter to close on, I think. Um, I had my seven minutes against Tonga where I just absolutely <laughs> missiled my body into everything I could. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, in pretty much the first tackle, I busted my AC joint, my left AC joint. So I was playing yeah. for five minutes with one arm. Um, 
but again, for me, it just it, it felt like the right time to to give the next next crop of hookers coming through um, their opportunity, and I, I, I could also sort of see the writing on the wall a little bit um, that I was um, probably not being favoured as much by the coaching staff just due to performance, which is my my own um, responsibility, um, and so sort of didn't want to be that um, older guy sort of hanging around like a bad smell. All right, and speaking of the, you know, these hookers, you know, USA seems to have a really good depth right now. Considering when you started to now, there's a lot of depth in the front row, especially a hooker. Now, you mentioned KP, you yeah. know, Big Joe's still around, uh, yeah. uh, Fawcett, Dylan's around. Yeah. And then you look yeah. at the props, you know, TT is, is becoming one of the older now, which is funny. You know, and you yeah. got the other guys in here, David Anu. Yeah. So looking at that, I mean um, – you know, obviously, we all love to see you in the mix, but I know that's not a thing now. But uh, no. we look good in the front row, am I right? I mean, I think that yeah, absolutely. I think our future looks good. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Patty Ryan, Chris Bowman's back playing right. as well. Um, Bowman was just an absolute scrum haul when he was at Leicester. He was he was he didn't play a lot, but he developed massively. He went from Wellington um, in minor ten up to Leicester, and. Mm -hmm. um, He's a bloody good, bloody good bloke. A really good character. Um, he's an excellent prop. Um, I think he just needs to be put into the right environment, and he'll bloody spread his wings. Um, David Anu is like a prodigy. Like for him to yeah. be where he's at at his age, is phenomenal. It's just uh, it's uh, unseen to be honest with you. Um, you really do forget how young that kid is. He's such a mature character as well off the field. Like he's just a he's a bit of an old soul. Not that he's like getting around in a Zimmer frame or a wheelchair <laughs> or anything like that. But he just he just fits in with the sort of the mid twenty five you know older crowd, and then his performances fit in with the same. Like you just cannot fathom how young that kid is. Yeah. Um, KP, he's again his ball carrying and his work around the field is unbelievable. He um, he's got such a long career ahead of him. And then you're probably looking at Dylan Fawcett and Joey, um, who are both you know not young kids. They're not bloody nineteen, but they're younger. Um, and they're the, now the senior guys in the team, which is it's going to be so cool to see what they do um, with the team, with the position, and, and where it goes in the next five to ten years. You know, you're down in the Manly now. You're still you're down in Australia. You're going to be there for a while. Mm -hmm. But what does the future look like for you now? Um, interesting question. So I, I, I've been thinking about this for for a bit. Um, I'm very lucky to be where I am um, within Paladin. Um, it's a privately owned company by three local fellas here that just wanted to help people get gear, and it's just blown up. So obviously we do the MLR, we do Minor 10, um, we do a bunch of other stuff in Australia and Singapore that is just crazy considering it was started from scratch in 2010. Um, so there's uh, quite a cool opportunity here to sort of build my own, I don't know, make, make your own adventure, Dora the Explorer style. Um, but the other thing that's been creeping into my head a lot lately is just um, uh, is to do with is to do with rugby and not necessarily playing, but more so coaching. So uh, I'm going to get my level two and level three coaching accreditation in Australia um, this year, um, yeah. which you know officially gives me some accreditation. But um, I think more so, um, it sort of signifies to me that I actually I, I, I want to coach. Um, so I'd be uh, I'd be very interested in coaching. I think um, sort of my, my background, my, my parent, well, my parents' brother, um, they're all teachers. I did a teaching degree at uni. Um, I finished them with a degree in exercise and sports science. Um, so I've got a bit of a background of um, teaching at uni for two and a bit years, and then exercise sports science for three years. So there's a knowledge of um, the physiology of athletes, and there's a knowledge of actually how to teach um, as well. As I definitely as well as I, I really. I, th I think a lot about the game. Um, there's some pretty simple stuff, which is hit, hit rucks and tackle blokes. But um, I, I, I like to explore um, all the little parts um, of the game and figure out how they can be done better and how they can be done to the letter of the law and maybe even a little bit further to get the most out of it performance-wise. Um, and there's definitely a passion for, from me. Like uh, the, the game for me has given me so much. Coming up from Adelaide where there's absolutely no rugby in Adelaide. I only played rugby because my dad did. So he left Oregon State. Um, came to Adelaide to um, to teach and wanted to play something as physical as, as football. Um, so he picked up rugby. And so I played rugby because he did. Wow. Um, and in Adelaide, that's not, not, not the thing. You don't play rugby in Adelaide. You're a bit of a, a leper if you do that. Um, hmm. So for me, I, I, I want to try and give other people the same opportunity that I've been given. Um, so if I can help um, convert or help um, enhance uh, some kid, some bloke's opportunity that he's got within rugby for him to take it further... Um, that would mean a lot to me because I know what rugby's given me. Like I'd probably be at, in Adelaide working at McDonald's if it wasn't for rugby, um, rather than um, you know having done what I've done with the, around the world. 
Um, so there's there's the little parts of the game teaching and the, the, the job specific stuff within the game but then there's also just being able to give someone the opportunity to play rugby at a high level and, and develop themselves so I, I think coaching is it's something that's creeping more and more into my head I, I hear everyone that tells me once you stop playing don't go straight into coaching you need to give yourself a break but I think I'm pretty likely to finish playing in the next couple of years um, for Manly and then probably go straight into coaching to um, I guess to keep challenging myself and you know, what I know in my head about the game and um, how I think it could and should be played, how I get that across to yeah. people. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll see you in the States coaching MLR or yeah. or, or putting on a number two for uh, the New England Free Jacks. And... <laughs> Tom TK from the Free Jacks. The yeah. that, he's, a very good, he's a very good mate of mine. I reckon I get about two messages a week from him just, to, just checking in to see if I'm available <laughs> and what I'm up to. And I, I ask him, I say, man, what's the weather like? And he goes, oh, it's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And I go, that, well, there's your answer. <laughs> yeah, just stay where you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll take me half a day to get warm to be able to run around in that weather. <laughs> well, listen, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, good luck in the rest of the season. I think we need uh, and, it. You know, and uh, we'll cheering for you, man. Beauty. Cheers, Bill. Thanks for your time, mate.